Um, but it's the question that I keep getting asked by, by viewers. So for those of you listening on podcast, I'm sitting down with my very old school friend, Alex Groundwater, also known as my quant guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is a fun term. Like this, yeah, Any seen... real quants would be very unhappy about that. But hey, so she's like... <laughs> would they? Yes. Okay. I've never met one, so... <laughs> um, I know, I got it from... Uh, have you, did you see that TV show, Billions? Yes, yeah, of yeah. course. And they all had those quant guys, quant people, and a quant person. Yeah, and the problem was you ended up rooting for the evil because it was better than the, the governance that was supposed to look after and stop the evil. Yes, like, yes. Oh, 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 well then. Which is worse, yeah, which yeah. is the least bad. Who's yeah. you rooting for? Um, so let's kick off the conversation with the phrase that I can't get out of my head that came from, from you in one of your texts to me, which is, this ends with homelessness and death in poverty. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a very jolly phrase, isn't yes. it? Death. What was it? Death. And death in, no, death in poverty. I, I mean, it, it, that simple. Um, so wait, let's start by just unpacking that three-word phrase: death in poverty, mm -hmm. for the country, for most people, for just unfortunate people. I mean, no, for a large number of people. I mean, there will always be um, people who retain their wealth and have fantastic retirements. Um, and lots of private health care and ongoing, they'll, and they'll be great. They'll need fortified communities. Though. They will need fortified communities, although that's the benefit of being in the UK. Not so many people with guns. America might not be so pleasant. Yeah, that's another whole conversation. Mm -hmm. But let's, yeah, let's just stick to the UK. Um, and what sort of type... So, so we, we're this is your... Can't get, I mean, there's got to be the worst case scenario. It's got to be it worse than that. It, 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 it is the worst case scenario, but it's it, it's a scenario that I think will play out across a lot of the Western world. In and what it, sort of timescale are you talking about? Well, I mean, our generation. Um, so I'm talking about when when we're retiring in the next sort of twenty years. Um, so you're looking at starting mid twenty forties, and extending for a long period of time. Um, and it's really, it's because of the economic model that we've had for so long, which depends on an ever-growing younger population to pay for the older population. Yeah, yeah. And that's being turned on its head. I mean, the baby boomers, there were a lot of them, um, but they were... Hence, baby boomers. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the clue is in the yes, title. Yeah. Um, but in recent years, certainly since uh, 1999, 62% of our population growth has been from immigration. Yeah. I mean, our population has grown as fast as it did, if not faster, than during the baby, baby boom period. But very little of that is to do with people giving birth in this country, mm. um, who were born in this country, yeah. and much more to do with us bringing people in. And that, I mean, there are a lot of forces at the moment trying to halt immigration, slow down immigration. That's about the only thing that's keeping the economy propped up in terms of paying the pension. It's still a fallacy that so many people have, that you pay national insurance and you're building a pension pot that then gets paid to you on your retirement. Yeah. And no, no, that money's all gone. I mean, it is the young person, you know, we have spent the last X years paying for our parents' pensions and our children will pay for our pensions. And if you have less children um, and more old people, then it doesn't work. Um, so this accelerated growth that we've had in the last 20 odd years needs to continue and yet the public are crying out to stop it you know the country's too full there are too many immigrants like population growth you mean. yeah the only way you can sustain it so that our pensions um, are in any way livable and let's face it the state pension at the moment I think is a maximum of just over 10,000 pounds a year well unless you own your own home and you have no other bills how are you going to live on ten thousand pounds a year? It's probably going to cover your energy bills. <laughs> exactly, especially when, at this point, almost thirty percent of all households in the country are single occupancy. You know, if there's two of you in the house earning ten thousand pounds a year from your pension, then maybe if you don't have a mortgage, if you're not having to pay rent, mm -hmm. but how else do you do it? So you go, well, that's okay, that's okay, because there are other credits that you can get. Well, again. That money only comes from the tax money. 
No, I met a guy on the foot ferry in Dartmouth a few months ago. Late at night, cold, windy night. And we just started chatting while we were waiting for the ferry to come over. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, in his 40s. Yep. He had just finished work. He had a job on minimum wage selling tickets for boat rides or something like that in Dartmouth as a tourist. <clears throat> and he told me, he said, yes, my wife and I, we, managed, we, we just managed to pay off our mortgage. And he said, and that is the only reason we can afford to eat and live now. Yeah. He said, you know, I, got, I, I bought my home really early. I, I, he I, must have been very early 20s. Yeah. Yes, exactly, he was, yeah. yeah. So he said, and it was very simple, he had a job in an electrical store. Um, and he said, I just, I sold washing machines. Um, and I just worked hard and got my head down and saved my money. And But there is no way that somebody working in an electrical store today exactly. could buy in most parts of the country. Yeah. This is the point, but he said it's only because he did that. That yes, early on yeah, yeah, absolutely. That he, he said if he had rent or mortgage to pay now, he wouldn't be able to afford to get to work and back. He said it costs him half of what he earns to get to work and back. Yeah. Um, and he said I go to work, but he, because uh, he said at the end of it, I've got about twenty-seven quid extra a day from my work once mm. I pay for the commuting and everything else. He said, but gets me out, get to see people. Um, but he will, he and his wife, by the side, if she has a similar sort of career yeah. background, they will be the people who are living on the state pension. Yeah. They're not going to have a private pension pot that's sitting there paying out. And, and honestly, even if you do, even if you saved £150,000 in, in a pension, a private pension, that only pays you something like £3,000 a year. Yeah. I mean, it, it's peanuts. It's and this is what I mean by death in poverty, is there are going to be a lot of people um, his age, but certainly a little younger than that, yeah. who aren't going to be able to afford to have a house and pay off mm -hmm. the asset, um, will have private pensions because they've been made you know, in workplaces now and it has to be yeah. a workplace pension, but very small. I mean, they're based on what you earn. And if you're only and, uh, earning yeah. 25000 a year, your pension is not going to go a long way. No. So, okay, I want to try and bring this conversation into the context of people making home moving decisions today. Yes. Because that's, that's the audience, right? Yep. Um, and some people, like this chap I was talking about on the ferry, he bought his home really early on with a very long term view. Mm -hmm. Buy a home, work hard, pay off a mortgage have a free place to live not a free but you know yep. a rent a free place to live and as you say that's that's just not within reach for I mean even people on what well, you must know what the median income 31,000 pounds a year right so you can't you can't buy no I mean that so I mean, we've got all the data on that um, at no point in the last 20 years has it been possible for somebody on an average income to purchase an average house right Unless there was, yeah, you know, yeah, family yeah, yeah. wealth and yes. gave them a deposit, etc. Yeah. Um, but that's a hell of a statement. In the last twenty years, mm -hmm. it's not been possible for someone on an average income to to buy an average house. Well, I'll, I'll give you some context there. So, advisors, your mortgage advisors, any any property advisor will tell you that your you should only be paying twenty eight percent of your gross salary. Um, sorry, your net salary as a mortgage payment. That's that's affordability, 28%. Um, and people used to do that on a single salary if you went back you know, to the 70s, etc. That now has been impossible. Uh, in fact, you need two people earning the £31,000 a year. And then, actually, for much of the last 20 years, it has been in that 28% zone. Um, but for both of them, not for one, for both. Until we get to um, this year, because interest rates have risen, mm -hmm. it's now 35% um, of a combined. So two people would be paying 35% of their £31,000 after tax for a mortgage on an average house. That's an 85% okay. mortgage. It, it, you know, but conversely, as we just discussed, Almost 30% of all homes are single occupancy. Mm. Well, how does that work? Yeah. 
you know, how, how do these how do these figures go together? And they go together because we have an aging population that own quite large homes mm-hmm. uh, and often through bereavement um, are now single. But we have an awful lot of young people who do not own homes mm-hmm. and are paying rent and therefore don't appear in that mm-hmm. mortgage statistic. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm very worried for my niece and nephew in terms of being able to buy uh, a home in the future. Yeah. Hmm. And so, am I right in saying that that you would say this was entirely predictable? Yes. For how long has this been predictable? Over twenty years. Okay. Ever since the dot com crash. Okay. Um, and the reason that, despite it being obviously predictable, it's happened anyway, is because of short term political thinking. Yeah, it's all short termism. Yeah. Which which is just, that's imposed on us by the five year election cycle, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so well, there's no point talking about what we should have done, I don't think, because that ship sailed. No, we should talk about the future. We should talk about what, what, if anything, could be done. Well, and this is where people have got to be realistic. I, I like to look at the historical yeah, data because, it, yeah, exactly. Uh, and what we learn from that is going back to, oh, where are we? Going back to uh, 1833. For a hundred years, the average interest rate was three point nine percent. Okay. As you move forwards, we then had the two world wars. Now that was when Keynesian economics started, and we had for the first time an interest rate that was set and kept at a at a, a level because before that it bounced up and down one or two percent either side, but averaged three point nine. And over that whole war period, as we got into huge debt. Uh, in Bank of England rate was 2%, mm-hmm. and it stayed 2%, because the idea was that if you kept interest rates low, you could still have spending within the economy, and the key part of the Keynesian thing was, as long as you still allow the free movement of money and spending, you can boost production. After that period, as the baby boomers uh, started to enter into the workforce, we then entered a period of hugely high inflation in the 70s, and also very high interest rates. The average interest rate for 20 years from the 70s through to the 90s was um, over 11%. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. The average interest rate for 20 years was 11%. 11.4%. What, through the 80s? Yeah. Yep. But we had great growth in the 80s, didn't we? Well, that was the problem. And this is where the media paints inflation as being a terrible thing. And, you know, inflation is we've got to beat inflation. Well, not really. Because if you have negative or deflation, you are in a recession. What you want is steady inflation. You want to, that's why the Bank of England have a target of 2%. Yeah. You want a nice steady growth rate that shows that you are getting more bang for your buck. Mm-hmm. And then you have an interest rate above the inflation rate because that's good for investors. It's good for investors because the inflation rate is what tells you the value of real money. Mm-hmm. So 100 pounds today is worth less than £100 20 years ago. Everyone gets mm-hmm. that, but it's easy to be fooled by the £100, the £100. If your inflation rate is higher than your interest rate, even if a business is making a return, even if it goes, oh, well, we've got more money now than we had then, you haven't. The inflation has taken away from anything that you're, you're getting as a profit. So investors look and they say, oh, okay, wherever the interest rate is a couple of points above the inflation rate, that gives me a couple of percentage margin mm-hmm. in terms of selling my product in that, in that country. You know, it, it makes you a good investment, which then boosts your, your product mm-hmm. because you have more investment and therefore you have more employment and therefore you are producing more. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it's not a sustainable one, is it? Yes, it is, as long as you can keep it stable. Okay. The problem is that by human nature, we have peaks and troughs. Yeah. Um, And then we have interventions. And this was the insanity from 2008 onwards. You know, almost 0% interest rates. Okay, so devil's advocate. 2008, it looked... My recollection, and I have no idea whether I'm just a a blind lemming who just believed the headlines or whether this was actually what happened, but there was a, a material risk to the banking system as a whole. Yes, which had it not been somehow averted would have led to something unimaginable. 
Yeah, but that's what we're facing now. Okay, well, let's, let's wait. Hold, hold on. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I know that. I get that. But so, again, just devil's advocate and, and just totally impartially. Like, so governments had to do something. They, they couldn't. Do, they couldn't do nothing. Because if if the actual financial system had collapsed, just ceased to function. Okay, so uh, and are, to... are you facing a, a, a bad few years of depression, or are you facing anarchy? I don't know. <sighs> yeah, and, and no, nobody can answer that right. because it didn't happen because of the interventions. Right. Um, that said, we've got to be clear: it wasn't that the entire banking system was going to collapse. Um, there were. And there was a massive issue with mortgages that had been given to yeah, people yeah, who couldn't yeah, afford yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And they got rolled up into debts that yeah. were then bought by, by various companies. Um, and, and it was a huge problem. It, but, but that was what triggered the liquidity crisis. Correct. Yeah. Um, and the liquidity crisis was threatening the viability of some large banks. Yes, they would have gone under. Right. They would have gone and under. And had those banks gone under, would there have been a potential domino scenario? Uh, yes, and we saw Lehman Brothers, and yeah. over here we saw Northern Rock. Yeah. Um, but as you as you saw, other companies took on. So I think RBS took on a whole bunch of the mortgage. Yeah. Um, yeah, from Northern Rock. Yeah. Yeah, from Northern Rock, uh, and and you just move it around in the system because you've got to bear in mind, since we got rid of the gold standard, money isn't real. Yeah. This is. Wait, okay, yeah, I, I know that. That's a that, that's a. How can we? That's a mind-blowing statement for someone that's never heard it before. Yeah. Because if you've never heard that statement before, you think, well, my, my, my money's real. I can go and spend it and I'll get stuff. No, that's why we have a run on the banks or the, the scare around a run on the banks. So we just covered pensions yeah. and the fact that when you put money, when your national insurance tax is taken, it doesn't get put into a pot for you uh, and therefore your money pays your pension. It's actually all spent. It's your children that pay your pension. Right. It's sort of the same thing with banks. If you go and you pay your salary into a bank and you have a savings account, yeah. there is not an account sitting there with your money, with your money in it. Right. That, that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> as soon as your ledger. Yeah, exactly. Right. Now, as soon as your money, and certainly this is what was happening back in the late 90s, yeah. you may remember you would come home um, and there would be letters on your doormat and there would be five offers for a new credit card or for a car. Oh, I remember. Loan. Yeah, it just... I, got, I, 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 got, I, I filled my boots. You I, were... <laughs> I, I filled my boots. Yeah. I was a complete, like, way. Yeah. I'd already been bitten by that point, right. so I avoided right. those. But, you know, th that was the, the totally uninhibited lending by yeah. the banks. Um, it really was. I mean, I remember being given credit for something that I thought there's no chance. There's yeah. no chance. And they did. Yeah. And, and you know why that happened? Because in 95, you had the bearings collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and the Bank of England was supposed to be regulating all the banks. And so the government said, well, I'm sorry, Bank of England. You're not doing a very good job at that, are you? Look at bearings. That was a real, that was a bit of a cock up. Um, let's get someone else. Let's, let's create a group. We'll call them the FSA. And they will regulate it. And you guys, you just set interest rates. You go off and you do that. You keep inflation. We'll give you a target, 2%, rock and roll. And the Bank of England said, well, okay then. And the FSA, who were supposed to be regulating the banks and making sure that they were not lending ridiculously, just didn't do anything. And right. so we ended up in 2008. Now we have the FCA, mm -hmm. which could Conduct. be, yeah, but could be the FSA by any other name. Yes. Um, Anyway, so what banks do is they take your cash yeah. and they lend it out immediately um, to other people because they earn interest on that. And that's how in the olden days they used to pay interest on your savings was because they'd lent it to a business or they'd lent it to an individual to buy a house. But if you put £100 in your savings back then, they could only lend £100, is that right? No, the they, fractional reserve banking, they could only lend £90 of your £100. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, literally, so they couldn't lend it if they didn't have it, and they could only lend 90% well, of what no, they Oh, it gets better. Because, let's pretend it's not £100, let's pretend it's £1,000. Okay. So you've put £1,000 in, fantastic. They say, mm, okay, we've got £900 that we can lend here, and somebody comes in and says, do you know what, I need to buy a car. Here's your £900. 
So this person goes and they give that £900 to the person who owns the car, who then takes it back to the bank and deposits it. Yes. And the bank goes, oh, look, I've got £900. I can lend 90% of that. And so it goes on. So £1,000 does not lead to £900 of lending. It leads to thousands of pounds of lending. Yes. Uh, and so you end up having a system where, in terms of real cash... Wait, sorry, because... The original person who put the thousand pounds, as far as they're concerned, their thousand pounds is still sitting. In yeah, the yeah, yes, absolutely. And the person who put the nine hundred pounds yeah. in, they think the nine hundred pounds yeah. in. No, no. no. <laughs> which is why, if we all, yeah. <laughs> if we... it sounds like something that your kids would think up, wouldn't it? Like, I, it's just a great game. It doesn't matter whether it's not real. Look, the sweetie <laughs> jar is always full. I yes. don't know how that happens. <laughs> um, yeah, I, pretty much. Um, and you end up with. A lot of imaginary money which is why if the whole population went to the bank tomorrow and said I'd like my savings back please I just want a big lump sum of cash no 99% uh, of them would go away sad there just isn't that much money in the system and probably quite cross too well, a little cross which again we go back to it's good we don't have too many guns yes um, yeah uh, that, okay, so let's just let's try and bring this back into the context of Death in poverty, and and why? Because the the the, the, per, the the title of this conversation is, how bad could it get? And it sounds like so. Death in poverty is the answer. Sometime twenty twenty five years from now. Yes. Um, for most people. Um, and that is, I mean, it can't get worse than that, can it? That that's that's no, that's pretty much the breakdown that's the worst of society. Case scenario, right? Yeah. As it, but it couldn't happen sooner than that. Yes, yes, it could. And I mean, this is, it, and it doesn't come about because of one individual cause. It's not just because population may not continue to grow. It's not just because we have vast amounts of debt. It's also the underlying production and productivity of the country. Yeah. And you, you know, you've seen recently there's a lot about GDP. Gross domestic product. Oh, yeah, GDP yeah, yeah. was very important. And, and the UK but is going to be the worst. Doesn't that include rent? Yeah, that's... The, that, that just totally undermines the whole... Th but it's not just rent. It includes, if you own a house, yes. if you don't pay rent, yeah. if you own a house, yeah. they estimate how much rent you would have to pay on that house and, and include, include that, that number. GDP. Yeah. But that's... Yeah, it's, it's good, isn't it? My father hasn't paid rent his entire life. He's, he's owned so his property. Yes. The GDP figures, which have been so feeble... Yep. ...for... 20 something years yep. like they haven't scraped above 2% though. we were well, no much worse than that we were at 2.4% annual growth for decades going yes. back to the yeah, 50s 2.4% yeah. stable nice and stable it's above inflation mm -hmm. you know it, it was yeah. it was good if if you don't include the massive drop of 2020 so if you go from 2000 to 2019 mm -hmm. Our average growth was one percent, and that's including people paying yes. fictional rent on houses on house prices area. that have gone up in, in massively. Wait, let's just see what this means. <laughs> it means. Uh, wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> just, just hold it. So this this is verifiable. Oh yes. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. can go look at how GDP is calculated, and they say in there that we assume that if you own your house, that you should be paying or could or would be paying. Rent. We assume we assume that you're paying rent on your house for the purposes of calculating GDP. And the money that you're paying in rent goes towards the country's GDP figure. Correct. That's a lot of money. Our housing estate at the moment yes. is valued at over eight trillion pounds. And what, they assume the rent on all of that? Yes. So they just go, right, eight trillion quid, the rent on that is X, that goes towards GDP figure. Okay. And do you happen to know off the top of your head what difference it would make the GDP figure if that figure wasn't. No, I haven't calculated it. I, I should do. But well, although we could do it very quickly now. Is it single digits or, or more? Well, let's, let's look at it this way. If you had a million pound property, yes. how much rent would you expect on that in a year? I mean, at least 50,000. Okay. So if you're expecting 50,000 on a million, okay. then you're expecting uh, 50 million on a billion. Yes. You're expecting um, 50 billion oh, on a trillion. Okay. Then multiply that by eight. eight. So it's 400, 400 billion. billion. 
And given that our given our GDP is somewhere between two point two and two point four trillion, are we talking about s several percent? Well, no, you're talking about. Sorry, we said five hundred billion, didn't we? Four hundred billion. Four hundred billion. Yeah. So that's that's just under just under half a trillion. So four hundred out of um, so let's do four out of twenty four. Twenty percent. It's over sixteen percent. Yeah. So without rent there isn't any GDP <laughs> no I exactly uh, now bear in mind I am to all of these numbers we're talking about so there isn't any growth in growth GDP. no but all it's just contraction constantly correct um, which is so uh, all of these numbers it's important to note that all of these numbers are real and what I mean by yes. that is they are inflation adjusted these are not nominal figures yeah, yeah. and that's how they hide the, G, the, the truth about GDP is most media outlets, most government sites like to show it as nominal. They try and pretend that £100 in 1970 has the same value as £100 today. They don't inflation adjust, okay. which is why the graph looks like it goes, oh, it's oh. going bottom left, top right, perfect graph, fantastic, yeah, yeah. thank you very much. No, you have to adjust. Yes. Um, and that's when you see the truth and you go, Oh, we are not in growth, we are in decline. So, we've already had, according to Nationwide yesterday, 5.6% uh, reduction nominal in house prices yeah. since August. And when you inflation adjust that, that's substantially more, potentially yeah. double. Yeah, so it's so just nominal. So, this is why I think, given that we are at the very early stages of this house price correction, mm -hmm. let's not trigger the people who get upset with the word crash. <laughs> Um, <laughs> gentle bump yes a change yeah <laughs> just a, a, a negative change in the figure what is what was that old phrase oh, we need to shift the paradigm oh yes <laughs> yeah recalibration is uh, yeah. Oh, I do nice. like yes, yes. Um, so we're at the beginning of this recalibration of the housing market yeah uh, potentially that's that's that, that seems to be an increasingly widespread mm. held belief uh, and this is the first time, I think, I literally think yesterday was the first time people have gone, okay, this what, this isn't a blip. Now you've got agents talking about, I mean, the, the, the chief executive of Property Mark, which is this estate agency association, is on BBC News tonight talking about house price falls, which, if I was the editor of that BBC News, I would be playing him a clip of what he said six months ago. When he said, oh, no, 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 it's going to be fine. It's all right. Experts are allowed to change their opinion, you know, oh. whenever they like. And it's, it can't be held against them because no one has a crystal ball. No, I know how much you <laughs> like that phrase. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, yeah, this, I, I'm just quickly basically rerunning my 35% nominal mm -hmm. top to bottom. I don't think it's that crazy anymore. I really don't. I've never thought it was a crazy. I, that's just, it's, it's, a, it's a figure I've plucked out of the air, right? It's a round number. But it's, it, 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 it's the only way to communicate what I feel is going to happen. Yeah. I'm not, I, despite my death in poverty, doom and gloom, mm. uh, and the Grim Reaper title, uh, I am not quite as negative as you, yeah. in that I believe that it's around 30 to 40% real yes. drop, which is a nominal, nominal would be a large component yeah. of that, you know, in excess of 25 to 30%, probably. Mm. But the reason I based it on um, pay, which let's face it, if mm -hmm. you don't earn the money, it's very hard to pay for the house. No, unless and less people working now. Well, and if you look at pay growth over the last 20 years, that suggests, because house prices have outstripped wages so massively, mm. the drop is exactly 36% in real terms for house prices to be as affordable as they were back before 2000, back before the dot-com crash, back before the internet okay. changed uh, a lot of things. Okay. Um, so I, I can't see it being less than that. I can't see it being less smaller, than 36. Being smaller, you can't see the drop being smaller than Correct. that. Correct, 36% in real terms. In real terms. Okay, so inflation adjusted. Yeah. So what does that mean if you're a first time buyer now who has the means to purchase, um, you don't, you accept, let's, I'm gonna take a typical profile of, of the kind of con uh, questions that I get, because there is this irrational compulsion 
amongst a lot of first time buyers. I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. Mm. What I'm saying is they detach themselves from the demonstrable reality of what's happening and go, I just want a fucking house. Yeah. Right? I have been saving, I have, I have been working my ass off to save a deposit. I have made compromises and sacrifices in order to get myself into this position. I deserve to Don't tell house. me I can't buy a fucking yeah. house now, right? Yeah. Or don't tell me that I shouldn't buy a fucking house now because, I, and I get that, I get that. Um, because I, in that position, I'd be like, you know, I, I'm not planning to move out. I want to stay there for a long time. Um, I've got a stable job because maybe I've got a government, you know, I've got a civil service job. I'm unlikely to be made redundant or fired because let's face it. <laughs> You don't get fired from those jobs and you just do something really bad. Well, I, I think you may find that changes in the near future. Okay, well, okay, that's another conversation. But um, what is, I mean, if I was in that situation and I had a career mm -hmm. which I felt adequately secure in, yep. and actually I also know because they publish the future price increases, I mean, they might get changed, but you know, you know what you can expect your salary to do over quite a long period of time. You know what your mortgage payments are going to be. So you know, whatever happens to the value of your house, if you're not moving from it, can I, am I confident I can afford the mortgage and I'm not gonna lose the house? Then fuck it, I'm gonna buy it. Yeah. So that's okay. I, I mean, that is, a, that is a rational decision to make if you are purchasing a home because you want to live in it. Yes. And you're not planning to move out of it. It's, it's, it's a, so that's why I say buy now, but do try not to overpay. A hundred percent. Okay. Uh, the issues that I see of this, even if interest rates from the Bank of England do reduce as we run into recession, which I don't think is likely, as we've just discussed, you know, interest rates have averaged in excess of of five percent over long periods, up to eleven point four percent. But so, so, yeah, so even if they do, it, even if they do, mortgage rates are unlikely to go below five percent. So if you're somebody who's sitting there thinking. Oh well, it's okay because in a few so, years. So you're time, talking about typical first-time buyer mortgages, right? Yeah, because yeah, there there are already products that if you've got a forty percent deposit, it's now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking but about when you've yeah, only got a yeah, 10, 5, yeah. 10, 15 percent deposit, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and a non-perfect credit rating. So yes, unless you yes. are the absolutely perfect yes. client, um, I think that sounds like a joyless life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I, I do know a few, yeah. um, they are quite joyless. You're right. Uh, <laughs> But uh, hey, listen, I, I, I don't, that's not a criticism because if you want security and stability yeah. and you choose to make that your life's priority, then hey, there is actually some joy in that stability and security if you can get it. But you probably have had to sacrifice quite a lot of joy to get to that position of security. And so yes. Yes. Uh, I, just don't, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> you mean you're not going to say boring bastard? Am I allowed to do that? Is that, is that okay? Um, anyway, so... As long as people aren't fooling themselves that interest rates and mortgage rates will go down and therefore their payments will reduce in the future, mm -hmm. um, yeah, great. The biggest issue then is the deposit because the house prices yes. are you know, yeah. at, at an all-time high now. Although it's taken them a very long time because were. the last, or oh, yes, I'm sorry, were. <laughs> they were in 21, is yeah, what I should yeah, say, in the beginning of 22. Yes. Um, but it took them from 2007 to get back to that level, yeah. and again, people don't see it because yeah, they see it in nominal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but actually, okay, let's just let's just touch on that. It's really useful. So, in real terms, mm. adjusted for inflation, house prices did not reach their two thousand and seven levels until twenty two. It was literally twenty two. So, f wait, that's fifteen years. Yeah, that's the statement that bears repeating. It took fifteen years for house prices to restore themselves in real terms, not nominal. So that means, never mind the actual sticker price, the actual value adjusted for inflation did not uh, get restored for 15 years after yeah. the last. Right. What Do you know off the top of your head what it was in nominal terms? It was still six or seven years, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's a little less. Okay. Um, but it, it still took, and this is whenever there is a house price recalibration or correction, <laughs> Um, it takes much longer than people think because that's normally associated yeah, yeah. with either, in this case, unusually, a very low interest rate event, yeah, yeah. normally with an inflationary event. Um, and, and so value and price become further separated mm -hmm. than they would do if you just had standard 2% inflation every year. 
Here's a question. Given that we're facing death in poverty mm. in a couple of decades' time, why not go out, borrow money, rent, piss it up the wall and live the high life? Because, hey. <laughs> well, mostly because banks won't lend you. You see, this was the whole no, idea. But, 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 I, I have heard the expression that uh, someone thinks that we're going to own nothing and be happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, I, this, this, I spent some time in Moscow. Mm-hmm. So I spent quite a lot of time in Moscow with an old school friend of mine who I, I was out there because I was working with a software development company out there for my CRM systems. And on Facebook, I hadn't seen him since school. It's just a really cool yeah. friend of mine. Um, said, hey, I live in Moscow. Come and stay. Nice offer. Brilliant. Yep. Um, so I, and he, he was out there working for a, a, a big global commercial property firm with his London contacts. He spoke fluent Russian and by this stage. This was in, what are we, 2005, 2006? 2000, no, 2008. This is, actually, this is 2007, 2008. <laughs> okay. Probably enough. Um, and I spent, I've got to be, I've got to be careful what I say here. I've got to think about how much I can reveal about what went on on my trips to Moscow. But let's put it this way. I witnessed firsthand on a repeated basis a population of young people who were living like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. Genuinely. And I remember being quite taken aback by it and he said they're expecting massive regime change or something like that within the next decade right they do not see long-term stability as a population this country and that's why they're living like this because hey you know who knows yes, what's going to happen absolutely. when let's just, just let's just let's just live for today i mean yep. and they really did i mean that was the that was the that was the most intense real life experience of people living like there's no tomorrow that i've ever had it's unforgettable um, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, brilliant. sort of the reverse of COVID. COVID. They didn't care about all the things that Western civilization cares about. They didn't fucking no. care. And if you tried to think, well, what about this? What about that? They kind of looked at you blank, like, sorry, that's an actual problem for you guys, is it? You, can, you know, I, I remember once I was I was in a city called Saratov, which was sixteen hours by train from Moscow. Right, sixteen hours across the bleakest wilderness, just yeah. Uh, and this is a bit earlier on, and I remember, I don't know if this is digressing or not, it's not, because this comes back to the death and poverty thing, right, and how people are choosing to live, and the question I'm coming back to is, should young people today Mm. be considering nice long-term commitment to their bank, or living, or making the most of the next 20 years? Uh, What a tough call. Um, Because that's, I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to, isn't it? It is, yeah, and, and I would not blame late teenagers 20 somethings for being pretty hopeless at this point yeah. you know why why would you the chances of you being able to afford the same level of housing that your parents or at least grandparents are living in mm-hmm. the chances of you having those nice holidays uh, all of those things just unaffordable now in this country unless you are lucky enough or have worked hard enough or a combination of the two that you've gone to the right university and mm-hmm. you are now qualified as a doctor or as yeah. a lawyer or you've been accepted into the banks, uh, um, yeah. you know, whatever it may be. Certainly there are very high paying professions, but at the same time, for the vast majority of people, wages now are, are not great. They have not kept pace with housing and they also haven't kept pace with all the other luxuries that people like you and I, when we were 20, thought were our right. Oh, do you? Mm. What, drinking good red wine? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'll yeah, do it. Yeah. No problems. It's so expensive now. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, 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 I'm very like, unhappy for the, for the young people today. How old? you got nieces and nephews? Yeah. How uh, old are they? 12 and 8. Right. Uh, See, because I've got kids, 7, 6, and 7 months. And I have no idea what their 20s look like. No. I have no idea. You know, the the, conf- the topic of this conversation is is how bad could things get? Well, they could be in their twenties, living in a post nuclear 
No, come on. I don't think I, we, we, we're not heading for a nuclear war. No, I don't think we're heading for one. We're talking about worst case scenarios here. Yeah, like, it's not out of the question. Yeah, but and, and what do you think? Is, do you think actually it really is? Out of the I really do think it's out well, of the question. Well, that's good news. Uh, that's some I mean, good news. Yeah, exactly. Sense, no, I mean. Okay. I, all right. Good. No, no, that's good. Because so, if that was happening, then there really would be no point in, in worrying about anything. Um, but it's worse. You see, a, a nuclear war is not actually the worst case scenario. It's not a worst case scenario because you have a sudden event and then people work together to get past that and, mm. and, and create a new society. What we have is the slow decay and erosion yeah. of the ability to do anything, oh. which is, it's almost worse. It's like having, yes, you know, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's, like, it's like being, having bits amputated, uh, you know, a, a, a limb at a time. Just putting the sauce when it's cold and slowly, slowly you know, which would you prefer? I'd rather have the nuclear war, which yeah. isn't going to happen, but yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, this is going to be horrendous for a lot of people because there will be people who are used to a certain way of living who just discover that they can no longer do it. Okay, and their kids certainly won't. And their kids will never even have been used to that way right. of living. They right. will never have had the opportunities. So in some ways, you and I have actually had it pretty good. Yeah. Not quite as good as our parents. Right. But, yeah, fantastically in comparison with people younger. Yeah. Um, I think our parents, I actually said this to my mother, I think they had a fantastic late middle age yeah. We had a fantastic early. Yes. Yeah, it was our teens and 20s. Oh, were yeah. our, our 20s and 30s. I mean, my 20s and 30s, actually, my 40s are pretty, very good. But my 20s and 30s, especially, were. Yeah, phenomenal. Already begins to feel like, was it really that good? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it really was. It really um, was amazing. Um, my parents' 20s and 30s were a bit tougher in the 60s and 70s. But their later years, they've had it. Well, very this, nice. this is the thing. And. Well, you could argue that one of the reasons they had it so good was because of the Second World War. Yeah. Because they had all of this fantastic new infrastructure. They had the new mm. nuclear power stations. They had new motorways and new hospitals. Huge numbers of new houses. Uh, the welfare state. Yeah. And, you know, all of these things came together to make sure that if you were doing well mm. in the, over that time period, you were doing really well. Yeah. But even if you were doing badly, there was a cushion to protect you with the welfare yeah. state. Not wonderfully. I mean, let's face yeah, it. You yeah. know, houses didn't have loos in doors up yeah, north yeah, and that yeah. sort of stuff. It wasn't. But nobody minded. No, it, it's what you're used to. Yeah. We have become so used to yeah, yeah. having whatever we want, whenever we yeah. want it. You know, everything is as a service. Mm. Netflix streaming as a service. I'll have, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is why I joke about Bill Gates and, and Bezos coming together to do new SaaS shelter as a service. Mm. You won't own a flat or rent a flat. What you'll do is have a four-hour. Now, you can choose to have it heated or not for the extra premium option. Upgrade. And you could go for two units, which will give you an eight-hour full sleep. But you just go around and there will be units that you can rent. Um, it's shelter as a service. Why would you own anything? Let's not play into the whole WEF debate. No, that's not for this. No. Although, um, <laughs> you're talking about how bad things could get. Yeah. It's, it's hard not to talk about. Well, although, and, and this is the thing, is the World Economic Forum, no doubt... Uh, has far too much influence across the world uh, from a political and financial perspective uh, for a bunch of unelected people. Yeah. However, one of their things is there will have to be a step change in the way that finance works. And I, I agree with that. The Western world has is in so much debt. Uh, has To whom? Well, and this is the wonderful thing, is if you were to remove cash from society... Which I think is a terrible thing. Just let me yeah, up front. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, yeah. It's horrendous. Yeah. It, it, it leads to a whole bunch of terrible yeah. potential for government control, etc. Yeah. But if you do that, if you implement central bank digital currencies, then all these countries that are paying vast interest rates uh, and to service the debt that they have uh, between each other uh, to insurance and pension institutions, you can write it off. You'd have a debt jubilee. Yeah. Because it's ones and zeros at that point. Uh, okay, so so a massive debt write-off. Mm. If that were to happen, would it be an overnight thing or would it be a sort of a bit of a gradual thing that you start with with corporations and then countries? Oh, this or, is something that will take many, many years to do. Right. Firstly, to implement the infrastructure for central bank digital yeah, currencies. Yeah, so leaving for the infrastructure, the actual debt forgiveness... Would it start with consumers and then go through companies well, and countries? No, no, or no, 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 no consumers. We don't get any debts. There's nothing, nothing gets wiped off our balance sheets. 
This would only apply to um, country level and government okay. level debt. Okay. Don't think you're getting away with having your mortgage disappear. No, 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 no. Uh, that will just be converted. Unless you're a really sophisticated hacker. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> <laughs> that will just be converted from sterling to you know the sterling token in the digital currency. Um, this is about governments and therefore taxes yeah. and the ability to invest in infrastructure in the com in the country. Uh, that being wiped away because all the governments just simply speak to each other and forgive the... Yeah, yeah. And bear in mind, the reason I'm so concerned now is because up until quite recently, it was only the Western world that was in this much debt. But now as you look globally, Asia, uh, certain countries, including China, are now approaching the same sort of levels that we have across Europe, the US and Canada. And you go, well, Christ, once Asia's involved, you know, we're talking billions of people here. And yeah, this is a global issue. I mean, all you're left with is a few Middle Eastern countries in Africa that are not currently functioning under a vast debt load. Yeah. Whew. So, and just in a nutshell, when do, if CBDC, if slash when, CBDC becomes implemented for you and I, mm. um, con the consumer on the street. Uh, what are we talking about? Five years, ten years? No, uh, I very much doubt that they could do anything uh, faster than five years. Yeah, uh, five to eight years would be an accelerated program, and you could see that because it sort of fits with the whole twenty thirty agenda. Yeah. And they, you can hear them talking about it now. It's been mentioned. Yeah, the it's, it's more and more often. And if you look on the government and the Bank of England websites, there's quite a lot of papers mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, yeah. They just don't publicize that yeah. fact. Yeah. Um, but even then, even with that accelerated program, which I think they might aim for because it will tie up so nicely with all the 2030 stuff, very unlikely. Okay, so how, if you really want to simplify this, why does someone buying a home today have to consider the fact that they're going to die in poverty 25 years from now? Well, they shouldn't. <laughs> no, they should, you should never should. consider your own death. You should live your life as if you're going to live forever. Okay, okay, cool. But but like, it's, right, well, what would you do differently? Nothing. Just carry on and carry on as normal. Should we just carry on and, as normal? Well, pretty much. Try and make yourself as as rich as possible. Um, but, not so with, you, but not with cash. No. Well, <laughs> gold, rare earth metals. That's the way to go. But unless there is a step change. The reason I say death and poverty is because it will be a whole host of things, including the collapse of the NHS, and therefore treatments will require money. And there will be the haves and the have-nots, and there will be some who can afford it, and there will be others who suffer for decades, potentially, because unfortunately we have enough medicines that are cheap enough that they'll keep you alive. Mm. But you'll be in pain, yeah. and you'll be you know, unable to be a, a decent functioning human being because you can't afford the actual operation that you need. And it's, it's those sort of things where people's quality of life, especially for the last 10, 20 years, so let's say from the age of 60, because I do think that life expectancy peaked with our parents' generation. And I think life expectancy, really? yeah. Yes, if you look at, if you just look Damn at... It, I was happy to live to 120. I know you, I know you want to live forever. Um, no, 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 no. No, just no, 120. No, 120. I've worked it out. I've, I've, I work until 90. Yeah. That really worked. Like, be completely fully engaged in whatever I'm doing up until about 90. Like David Attenborough, who's just 96 and still fully engaged. Uh -huh. um, and then 30 years to enjoy... <laughs> <laughs> yes, even David Attenborough is looking a bit doddery these days. Yeah, but you know we've we've got another, we're forty years behind him, fifty years behind yeah. him. I'm not sure medicine will have advanced that much. I mean, there are fantastic treatments mm. which are coming online now, using the immune system to cure cancer with T cell therapies. Incredible stuff. There's one other thing I think is worth throwing in here, which people are just starting to talk about, but I don't think yet fully understand. I think Stephen Hawking nailed it when he said, if machine-produced wealth mm -hmm. was shared, everyone could live a life of luxury. Yeah. If it isn't, 
I can't remember the exact phrase, but it goes and say, then millions of people are going to starve and yes. be miserable. And that's that's the future, I see. Yeah. It's 100% right. So, he talks about machine-produced wealth. Now, I see, so there's a lot of talk about chat GPT. GPT okay. Yes, I knew that would come in at well, some point. Well, I think it's become important enough to, to be mentioned because it's already starting to demonstrate for anyone who wants to try it that it can carry out the functions of someone in a creative role mm -hmm. to a certain extent is are we going to be looking at the decimation of a lot of creative jobs you know, media jobs writing jobs that kind of stuff number one <clears throat> number two uh, just today i saw elon musk tweeted his concerns that they've already revealed political bias in the code yeah now maybe that's unconscious bias on part of the coders but again if you end up with an ubiquitous AI, uh -huh. that everyone's using because it's just brilliant. Uh, uh, but let's brilliant be, but let's be clear, it's not AI. No, no, no. Okay, I, I agree that the definitions, it's it's not artificial intelligence. It's not self-teaching, self-learning. No, I, I agree with that. They're still working on that. That hasn't been totally solved, has it? But whatever you want to call it, that function that is now starting increasingly to perform functions that otherwise previously only quite highly qualified humans could do. Yes. You're looking at the destruction of value of human work. Yes. On a vast scale, scale. and an accelerating scale. Yes. And now I tie that to robotics, which is what's happening at mm. the moment. And there will be a whole range of jobs. I mean, l let me put it this way. You start with agriculture and you go, well, you know, that would be easy to replace humans at an agricultural level. You don't need pickers if you've got robots that are good at doing this or planters. You go, oh, that's fine. That's manual. House building, again, you could potentially have robots doing oh, yeah, that. 3D printed housing things stuff like that. Exactly. But what do lawyers do? Solicitors? Oh, they, they're, they're already being, I know. They're all, five years ago, there were programs that were doing the job uh -huh. better than a junior lawyer. And the uh, same thing. Run 24 hours a day? Project managers. Yeah. The same thing with doctors in terms of doing diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's already been proven that the machine learning program that they use to detect sepsis is better than any doctor that they can throw at it. And so there's well, a great... Hopefully that's, that's just going to free up capacity of existing well, doctors to do the stuff that they really And there's a, great, there's a great author who isn't... Uh, if you haven't read him, Ian M. Banks. And he oh, is yeah. a science fiction author and he writes or wrote, he unfortunately has died now, but um, he wrote about a society called The Culture. And it is where I see us going. I look, like a lot of these science fiction writers from Jules Verne forwards, if you look at you know Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov, what comes to pass? These guys are, they had a crystal ball, obviously. Um, but what happens there is that the society is made up of people who are creative and artistic because they have no need to work, because all of their needs are taken care of by uh, real AIs yeah. and robotics, yeah. and therefore they can just lead these lives that um, allow them to explore all of their creativity. Whatever they want to do, they can do it. And I think we will get there. The problem is, like any revolution, like the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. created poverty and ghettos for people who went into cities trying to find jobs, child labor, it was horrendous. But out of that came this great society where Potentially you had more leisure, but certainly the standard of living improved. We're going through a technology revolution, and we've been going through it for 40-odd years now. I've heard, it, I've heard it referred to as the fourth turning. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, I was only recently read that because I've been, it's been yeah. my theory for a long time that with this tech revolution is going to change everything. But it's going to take a long time. And during that time, it's going to create a big divide in society, haves and have-nots, rich and poor, uh, healthy and ill unemployed and working and that's going to last certainly our lifetimes um, probably until the turn of the next century at which point if we've cracked AI by then if the robotics is so good that you are able to have a general artificial intelligence which is imagine iRobot you know mm, yeah, uh, yeah. somebody walking around where you really couldn't tell the difference right. potentially between a human and and mm. the android cyborg yeah <laughs> so if we get there, then yeah, fantastic. We humans suddenly have leisure and the ability to, to do whatever we want because money is, or money, tokens, value, whatever you want to call it, is no longer important 
because as long as you can get food and the robots will get that for you and we haven't right, totally right. destroyed the planet in terms of oxygen levels yeah. and we can still breathe and shelter is free because you can robots put up the building and they mm -hmm. mine the stuff and they create the timber so what does it matter so you so actually there's some optimism there you're saying yeah this could figure itself out so can we spend the last bit of this we're gonna to have to wrap this up um before too long what needs to happen in your view to avert death in poverty what changes and so i know that's a big massive question but but you know if we were to, to pick three things i mean for example right i'm not saying any of these things are possible these are all hypothetical or theoretical ones but um some form of modification of our political system that whilst keeping our ability to vote and remove our local member of parliament mm -hmm. at perhaps not all at the same time every five years but perhaps whenever actually our constituency thinks we've had enough of them um but at the same time re reforming enough that the short-termism goes wow. And this is this is where I'm afraid I don't see any way of averting it. I have looked at it from every angle that I can think of, and short of installing dictatorships, because a benign dictatorship does actually give you the long term. Singapore, yeah, exactly. Um, and accelerating CBDCs and debt jubilees, so that we have money within the country to invest in infrastructure to actually get our services, our energy, because all of these things are predicated on us producing enough energy mm -hmm. to produce other things. Yeah. Well, if we don't build some nuclear stations soon, we are in serious trouble of okay. having brownouts in our supposedly first world country. But even if we do those things... It doesn't feel like the first world anymore. No, it's not, no it I really agree. doesn't. I 100% agree. Partly, that's because we were first world first we're still resting on our laurels well but also it, it, and this is what i keep trying to explain to, to colleagues um who come back from places like shanghai and go, oh my god it's so incredible it's wonderful you go, yes but if you were there 50 years ago it was a fishing port now you look at london and you go oh god nothing works that's true we've but we've had a tube service mm -hmm. for 160 yeah, years yeah, 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 yeah. trying to fix something yeah that has X million passengers a day is much harder than just building a brand new thing. But we can't just build a brand new thing. And that's that's our problem is we are just a decaying old empire. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think all the benefits will be reaped in places like certain South American countries, Africa, um, and some so of the So what should a countries. decaying old empire do to avert death and poverty? Or, or is it- uh, Move to the Caribbean. I think it's the best bet. It's probably a good idea. Or, or Portugal, um, yeah. either way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, because I, I agree. I mean, I, I is, are there any examples you know of in history where there was major political reform that was without violence? Mm -hmm. Like major positive political yeah, reform? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, not. Mm, I don't know of any. No, I don't know of any. I, I know where there have been huge crashes and, and turmoil uh, in China, uh, Qing Dynasty type stuff, where there was no violent outrage from okay. the people. But of course, you know, you then had the, the Chinese Revolution and uh, Mao Zedong and yeah. all of that. So yeah, anything recent that I can think of, no, I can't, uh, no. There's always been social unrest and upheaval and, and yeah. violence to some yeah. degree. Yay! Yeah, let's, that was on a that, really positive on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> so, not just death and poverty, death, violent death yeah, and well, poverty. Yeah, well, I wasn't saying that. No, I know, no. <laughs> Can't we? We're English. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, just yeah. die quietly. I mean, yeah, that's the. Yes, with a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's too expensive. No tea. Uh, I mean, yeah. There's it, a sort of certain gallows humour to this. Mm. Because, uh, you know, I. I This sounds like a sort of unforgivable thing to say as someone that was born and raised in England. But I don't see what we have left to be proud of as a country. I think we did have many things to be proud yes. of. I think we rested on those laurels too long without creating any new stuff to be proud of. Yeah. 
I think other parts of the world have created new stuff to be proud of, and we're getting bitter about it as a country. Yes, yeah. And um, which is horribly unfair for the younger generation. They're like, wow, well, we've only just got here. Well, it's not our fault. Why haven't we got a better future? Absolutely. And I, you know, I can hear people saying from a long time ago, if we don't, if we don't pay attention to what's happening, we're headed for a really crap future. And this is beginning to feel like that that's coming true. I agree. I, and I, you've known me long enough, right? I am not a pessimist. No, you are the opposite of a pessimist. I have my whole life. I have been almost people have told me. Charlie, for fuck's sake, can you stop being so fucking positive and optimistic and cheerful all the time? I was recently called one of the happiest people that someone knew. Like, uh -huh. to, I am not. I am not a a, a, a a merchant of doom or gloom. And I was. My motto is, you know, just make the best of whatever it is. That's, yes. that, that's that's where happiness is. Like whatever your situation. Um, but yes. right now, I, as a parent with young kids, thinking twenty years ahead. Because you've heard the expression, you can only ever be as a parent can only ever be as happy as their unhappiest child. Yeah, which is it's don't know why that stuck with me. I feel like my job as a parent is to prepare my kids for this uncertain future. It's impossible to know what's going to happen. Therefore, the best thing to do is to prepare, prepare them for uncertainty. Yes, independence, rely on no one but themselves. Figure out, know how to do everything you need to do for yourself. Don't rely on anyone or anything else. That's the that's the best preparation I can think of for them suddenly yeah. got really deep in that uh, well, well but for our age group it was enough to just go to school yeah. and then if you wanted to go on to university and to get a job and yeah. away you go and if I look back the sort of things that I knew in my early 20s to live in an uncertain society mm -hmm. would have been no use at all yeah. I, I literally knew nothing so if you can prepare your kids so that simple things like they know how to grow vegetables and the seasons yeah, that things yeah. grow yeah. all the way through to how to potentially fix a vehicle or yeah, just yeah. stuff that you don't get practical taught stuff. Yeah, 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 practical yeah. useful stuff it's one of the reasons I homeschool my kids exactly I, I know um, do you want to add anything on the end of this conversation <laughs> no other than we will get through it not not us oh, the but, sun but will future, rise okay. yes future generations will get through it and they will have a better life unfortunately we are living in turbulent stroke mm. interesting times uncertain times yeah um, yeah the, 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 the world will keep turning and the sun will rise and set long after humans have gone yes yeah that's also true uh, but I actually I genuinely find comfort in that thought like whatever happens the sun mm. will come up tomorrow you know it's whether I'm here or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a happy note, Alex, thank you very much. It's Absolute been a really, pleasure, Charlie. Really enjoyable and fascinating conversation. I just hope the audio is good enough. Um, and if you're still listening to this um, or watching it, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even sure I'll put this on YouTube, but don't definitely do the audio of it. Um, thank you for, for listening all the way to the end and, and let us know what you thought of that conversation in the comments or wherever you want to. Um, uh, right, well, let's press stop and go and console ourselves with a drink, maybe. <laughs> Very good idea. <laughs>